lecture in the Courage to Be program and what is now the Courage to Be Common course. Um, my name is Tara Needham, and I am the Assistant Academic Director at the Hannah Arendt Center for, Bart, uh, for Politics and Humanities at Bard College. I'm also an, an instructor in the Courage to Be program. Uh, the Courage to Be series of lectures, classes, and student fellowships began in 2015 as a collaboration between the Hannah Arendt Center with the Center for Spiritual Life and the Institute of Advanced Theology as an examination of moral courage in our contemporary world. This semester marks its first time as part of Bard's Common Course offerings. Um, the program, in its different manifestations, has sought to answer or raise the following questions. What does it mean to act courageously in the 21st century? Which crises, conditions, and causes most demand courageous action by individual and groups? In what ways does modern bureaucratic society make the contours of courage difficult to discern due to shifting notions of responsibility, evil, truth, justice, and morality? This semester, there are four courses offered in the program. And each of these addresses these questions, approaching the concept of courage from a variety of disciplinary perspectives, exploring its many articulations from antiquity to our contemporary moment, and its relevance in fields such as law, literature, human rights, religion, politics, and philosophy. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge um, my fellow instructors in the program who are here tonight, uh, Thomas Bartscher, uh, Joshua, Bettiger and Laura Ford, and um, of course to welcome all of the students uh, that, that these, these lectures are really designed uh, to engage. A key component of the Courage to Be program is that it offers fellowships for BART undergrads who select, invite, plan, and host one of our speakers, as well as supporting other aspects of the program. Tonight's event was organized by student fellow Naomi Miller, and I will now introduce Naomi, who will also then introduce Sunita. And just, I did want to also acknowledge that we have um, several other ha uh, Hannah Rent Center fellows and interns here. Georgie is doing our media. Um, we have Top Talks fellows. And I also wanted to acknowledge uh, Phil Lindsay, who is our communications coordinator, who is doing a tremendous job making all of this sound and look good now and in posterity. Um, so now I'd like to invite our um, Courage to Be fellow, Naomi Miller. Naomi Miller is a junior at Bard, majoring in Religious Studies with a focus in Buddhist and Jewish Studies. While this is her first year at the Hannah Arendt Center, she has been passionate about philosophical and spiritual discourse for as long as she can remember. She previously worked as a gallery assistant at the Hessel Museum, which sparked her love of art history. When not in class, you can find her watching movies, meditating, or making music with friends. Welcome, Naomi. <laughs> Thank you, Tara, for the lovely introduction. It's all under introducing Sunita today. Sunita Alazada is a young Afghan rapper working to end child marriage. With the poet's soul and activist back passion, she uses rap to stand up for women and girls' rights. Sunita was born in Afghanistan under the Taliban regime. Being almost sold into marriage twice at age 10 and again at 16, Alazada's mother, who had moved back to Afghanistan, was struck by her return home to meet her future husband. With the help of rock Sara Kimmergami, an Iranian filmmaker who recorded her journey in a documentary called Sunita, Alizada recorded a powerful and evocative video of Daughters for Sale, which has been seen around the world. The rap song and her story helped Sunita to obtain a full scholarship to come to the United States in 2015. Today, Alizada lives in the U.S. doing a joint nature at Bard in human rights and music. Besides school, she is still a passionate advocate to end child marriage and promote the rights of other women around the world. She has shared the stage with heads of state, Nobel laureates, renowned change makers, and helped develop a curriculum on child marriage for over one million students. 
Her message about ending child marriage is reaching the highest levels of global leadership and civil society, and her story and vision have been shared worldwide. I first came into contact with Sonita's work when a friend of mine sent me daughters for sale on Instagram. Immediately, I was captivated by Sonita's bravery, vulnerability, and of course, incredible talent. When asked to pick a speaker who exemplified courage and who could connect with foreign students, I couldn't think of anyone who fit that description better than Sumita. I've been honored to work with her leading up to this event, and I'm honored to introduce you to her now. Please welcome Sumita. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Awesome. So, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. And um, I'm going first to perform a song called Pamir. And I wrote this song after August 15, when the Taliban took over. And I'm sure some of you have seen the clips on social media of women fighting for their rights uh, in the heart of the Taliban. And this, all these little videos, they speak of courage, women fighting for their rights. in the government. They own even businesses. And today with the arrival of the Taliban, all this progress is at risk. It's being threatened. Women are being beaten, killed, but they're refusing to give up. They're protesting and fighting for their rights, for the little freedom that they had gained. My name is Sonita again. I'm from Herat, Afghanistan. I was born under the Taliban regime. Uh, my family fled to Iran to escape war, hunger. And I grew up as an undocumented refugee in Iran. In Iran, I was not allowed to go to school. Like many other Afghan refugees, 
But I was lucky enough to find an NGO that provided basic education uh, to me and Afghan refugees like me. It was there that I learned how to read and write. It was there that I learned uh, the first new notes of music, and it was there that I learned about my dreams. Dreams, something that women, girls around me, they did not pay it much attention to it because uh, the image that they had was limited by the men, by the society that was designed for them. I lived in Iran with unjust injustice around me, around my friends, my classmates, and they often came to class with bruises on their faces because of saying no to child marriage. For my age, I was a little younger for all these um, issues around me, but I did not give up because I did not want fear to drive me to my end. So instead, I tried to find a different way to express myself, and that's why I chose rap music to express myself. Um, just to mention, again, I was sold, almost sold into marriage at age 10, but it was called off for different reasons. I even don't know. And at age 16, again, my family wanted me to return to Afghanistan to marry someone who I did not know. I was not surprised. I was not shocked, because this was something that happened to my mom at age 12. This was something happened to my two of my sisters, and this was something that was happening to my classmates. I was kind of ready for it, or waiting for it. And when I reviewed my dreams in my dreams book, I realized that this could not be my future too. So I wanted something different. I refused to go back to Afghanistan, and said I used my voice as a weapon to speak for my rights, to speak against the tradition and to speak against my family who I love the most. But this was the only way for me to stand up for my rights for myself. And um, with the help of Rukhsar Bhai Magami, I was eventually able to uh, put together the image that I had for my music. And I, uh, when Doris Porcel was ready, we put it on YouTube. Finally, people were paying attention. And that's how I got full scholarship to come to the US for the first time, to go to a real school. Probably some of you uh, might ask how I got the courage to face all these different challenges alone. Before I answer, I want to know, can someone tell me what courage means to you guys? Courage. Courage. Speaking up. Oh, uh, yeah. That's why. Speaking up. Speaking up. So, in fact, to me, that was courage. You were the first person, I guess, okay. who raised her hand. That is courage. Uh, for me, this is the foundation of courage because you raise your hand, you want to speak up, you want to share your opinion, your thought, your answer. And for us to really grow up, what do we need to do? We need to question, we need to speak, we need to change, exchange ideas. So thank you. And you wanted to say something? Um, it's also a lot about like doing things that, like standing up for what you believe in, but also in the face of adversity. Exactly. And this leads me to um, what's his name? Joel Ronian. He says that uh, if you want to be brave, if you want to be courageous, first of all, what do you need? You need to fear something. You need one fear at least. And the second thing is that you need to face your fear. The third is that when you face your fear again, you have to feel like less scared of it. And the fourth thing is that you have to face it again and again until you feel like you're not scared of it. It's like the story, uh, Bravery Soup. Have you read it? No? 
it's on YouTube also, you can check it out. It's uh, written for you know, children, but adults can learn a lot from it. And it's basically, keep telling you that you need to face your fear. And we saw this process in my story. I was afraid of standing up against my family, especially my brother, that they were always like uh, in charge, and they were the ones that would decide. And I was scared that people might not listen to my son. I was scared that the government of uh, Iran could deport me back to Afghanistan if I would speak up and talk about immigration, try to manage something that was happening in Iran. So all these fears were around me. I was scared of them. And I had two options. I could just give up and let my fear drive me around order me around, or I could face them, even though it's challenging, it's scary, I, I could face them and break the wall that was built with fears, I could break it and see what was behind it, to discover more. So that's what I did. And uh, to be courageous, it's not like you don't need to be a superhero. You don't need to have a superpower or anything like that. You just need to be committed. You need to uh, be committed and uh, you also need to be comfortable with leaving your comfort zone and try something difficult, try something that uh, always your brain tells you that you can't do this. Try something different and what I did that was different from my sister, my friends, and my classmates was that I dare to have dreams. Coming from a very conservative uh, society that they could only see me as a bride, as a mom, that's it. I dare to have dreams. And I went even further. I imagined my dreams, I found pictures of my dreams, and I put it in a notebook called Dreams Book. I'm going to pass it around. Take a look at them. That's my first dreams book. And the first page of my dreams book has an ID because this is how I grew up with no ID. So I wanted to have an ID and now I have two, obviously. And some of those dreams I accomplished, small and big. While accomplishing those small and big dreams, I experienced so many things and I faced so many different types of fear. And I still have fear within me. It's not like it's all gone. So, but the thing is that the fear that I have right now, the one that I live with today, is less stronger than the ones before that could keep me um, behind bars for years. And that's what happened when I was in Iran until I saw that my dreams were becoming stronger than my fear. So I decided to risk it. And it did work. So uh, this is how I found my courage by facing them. Can any one of you guys share a story that you faced your fear? How did you respond to it? And what happened? I'm sure you, all of you had a moment that you faced your fear. So now you want to share that's the best moment. Just face your fear, speak in the crowd. That's one time, <laughs> exactly right. You want a mic? Oh, I think I can just talk. Um, I think for me, the first thing I thought of was um, living alone somewhere completely new and country, um, with no family, <laughs> um, which was really scary to me, but ended up being really worth it, and I learned a lot about myself through the experience. Okay. So, yeah, thank you for sharing. Uh, so, also, it's not easy to speak in a crowd. This is a good moment for you to just try it. And if you want to give it another chance, we could play a short game. Uh, <laughs> we need two people. And who among you is scared to sing in a crowd? Yeah, go. 
Uh, and who wants to be her fear? Someone who doesn't want to let her succeed. Just be, just acting someone who can be negative. Anyone? You won't have a lot to do. Yes. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Huh? Thank you. So, you can close your eyes and tell us like where you are, who you are, and why do you like to sing, and if you could tell us what is your fear. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm at Bar College. My name is Morgan. Yeah. Um, why do you like to sing? To, to sing? Yes. Um, just like all the friends and stuff, like the sky is really blue and crying is really bad. Crying? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, oh, also, you want to tell us what is your fear of singing? Oh, you mean singing? Like music? Yes. Oh. Um, uh, why do you fear singing in, in front of people? Because I'm not musical. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> and then, um, you're not responding to anything, but... So your next step is to go to your fear, okay? It's going to be a conversation between you guys. So this is your fear. She's going to try her best to not uh, let you succeed. And then... You are your own person and you want to succeed, you want to achieve your goal singing. I want to see how you're going to react to this. Okay? Don't go to her and be like, hey, dude, let me sing. <laughs> be like very strong and committed. Okay? You can stand up and face her. How do you feel? You have to be strong no. too, as she is. Do I respond? Yeah, but you're the fear, you're the ne negative guy, so. Okay. Uh, I hate that you hate me. <laughs> <laughs> I think you also fear what I have to do, my fear of singing. Yeah, so this is your fear of singing. How are you going to respond to her um, to be able to sing, to pass this fear? Um. It's just that my roommate told me that I, I'm really not beautiful, so that I just don't want to like sing in front of people. You should definitely listen to them. <laughs> but they are not beautiful themselves. Uh, well, they're, they still sound like experts. Well, I just, I just don't want to like, I just don't like people and they scare me. And you have to look at the people if they scare you. Okay, see you here. What is scary about them? Um, I don't know that they are like thinking things of, and they might do things to me. <laughs> and I can't control what they do. Exactly, okay. And how do you want to control them? Um, with with uh, the three goal you have? Um, like maybe just talk to them. And they will like, they will like be smiling and his one will be able to communicate and we'll see that they're not like that scared. Mm -hmm. So now your fear is here. What you could do is basically when she's saying no you can't do it, just start to do it. Like sing. If she's saying you can't sing, just right away sing. So it can, you know, push her away. That's one way for you. But that was a conversation between you guys to solve it, so I don't really know the answer. So this is one way to face your fear. And if you're scared of people, you have to think about it. If this is for people, then it is not for you. Why do you bother yourself to do it? And if it's for you, then you're doing it for yourself. So it should be fine for you to perform in front of people. Yeah? Because you care about how you feel. And if this is exactly what we are doing, what we are doing, like trying to achieve our goals, because this is what we want to achieve. It's not what they want for us. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you guys so much. And now, uh, it doesn't work, so I don't know what to 
show you. <laughs> but uh, we are doing a project on campus called RSU, which is a TLS project, and we have been working with different clubs on this project, especially after August 15, because we want to sponsor Afghan children, Afghan families in Afghanistan. Um, RSU basically means wish, and uh, we have a team of students on campus. Every month we hold a sip and paint event, which basically students, they paint, and then uh, we take their paintings and sell it to donate the money to the children in Afghanistan. We buy food packages with the, with the uh, donations. And so far we have been able to sponsor uh, 644 individuals in Afghanistan, especially these days that's so needed because families have started to sell their children. Wow. Uh, yeah, so as I said, Arzu, Wesh, and we uh, get support from students on campus. And uh, this is a picture of our last uh, food packages for um, children, most of them are under 15 and they work. Uh, so we basically try to um, donate money so they can be children for a while instead of working. Because in Afghanistan these days, uh, more than 51% of families uh, send their children to work. Because of lack of work, because the Taliban no longer allow uh, single mothers, widows to work, so their only source for them is the children. And uh, that's another image of the support we sent. So now I'm going to share about uh, Vasnina. She's 10 years old. Um, a few months ago, she got shot uh, in her scalp and she lost her vision, right? Eye. And what we did, again, we held events on campus also on different uh, campuses, for example, in Colorado. We raised uh, some money to send it to her family and because her family are very poor and they could not take her to Pakistan to treat her. And that was the only way since all the doctors and hospitals were not functioning in Afghanistan. So we were able to send her to Pakistan. Fortunately, today she can again see and thanks to all the students here, thanks to you for participating in some of the events. And um, this is another story. This is uh, Medina, uh, the video we can play it. But this is an example of children working under the age of 15. Uh, her father was killed by the Taliban and she is helping her grandma to I have a source of support for uh, food and clothing. So we were able to sponsor her for a month. And because of what we are doing and what's happening in Afghanistan today, we have decided to extend our zoo to have another branch, which is basically we don't ask families or friends anymore to just donate uh, for one month and that's it. We are looking for families, for friends, for parents. If they want to adopt one of these kids, a distance adopt, uh, adoption, and you basically give up on one meal every month uh, and give it to these kids. So children in Afghanistan work between 30 to $50. If you can give up on one meal every month and then send it to us, which we then we send it to ASIL. ASIL is a program uh, that sells food packages in Afghanistan. You sign up uh, and then give um, the names, and then they deliver the food packages to the people. Uh, you will receive uh, the seeds. And this picture is one of our events. Uh, students come, have a drink, and then paint something, donate it to us. The next uh, week, we will sell it on campus. And what, this is one of our uh, selling days. And if you like to learn more, if, or if you want to adopt a child, which we are planning to have two more this uh, month, 
you can contact me, Khadija or Anna, and you can see the contact information there. So, um, right now, you, I'm guessing you saw the tables outside with paintings. Uh, this is well, a part of our zoo. We put all the paintings there for you to check it out and donate as much as you can. And um, if you have art uh, pieces, we could also receive those. Uh, so don't forget to check it out. We also have uh, letters to sign. Thanks, Aaron, uh, for creating the uh, letters. Uh, you can basically sign those letters to send it to your officials to pay more attention to Afghan refugees, Afghan students. And um, I guess now we have Kim May. Question. I'll have uh, Yu Zhen here running the mic back and forth. But first, just to get things started, I'll be the first one to ask a question again. I will ask. <laughs> yeah. okay, okay. Uh, you say in your song, Daughters for Sale, tell me what I can do to prove my personhood. As an activist, does it ever become like too tiring trying to prove something as basic as humanity? And do you ever feel like, do you think men or people in general who have been raised to see women in such a way, to see them as objects, do you think they can, that can never be changed in a full way and how do you go about that change? Um, I think uh, most of the songs that I write or perform sometimes I feel like heartbroken to even perform them, like brides for sale, daughters for sale. Uh, but I don't get tired of speaking about uh, all these men that think we are objects, for example, in Afghanistan and the child marriage in Iran. And, uh, it's not only happening in Afghanistan, just to make this clear, child marriage is happening everywhere, even in the US. So. For me, uh, to talk about child marriage, basically I'm talking about my tradition. And I know uh, where, where it's coming from because my family, I'm not expecting them to right away change who they are. Because this is rooted in them. Like it, This is a very strong root in Afghanistan within some families. So I'm not expecting them to right away change. But I gave my family six years and I can see the change in my conservative family. Uh, they used to shame me because of liking music, because of becoming a rapper, and today uh, my mom is a big fan of me, and she usually gives me ideas what to rap about. So uh, it could be exhausting and tiring and heartbreaking, but I do see changes because of music. Question? like sort of like because I feel like you're talking about your mom like changing her opinion and like a lot of the projects that you were working on like also connects people like individual people like when we look at structural problems I think sometimes we forget to look at 
individual people. And so when we're calling out like our friends and family, like if we disagree on like the issue or we want them to become more educated or aware on the issue, do you think it's better to use call in culture where you're sort of a little bit nicer and more gentle, or do you think that it's better to use call out culture where you're a little bit more stern and firm and maybe even a little bit assertive, aggressive um, on those issues? Like, do you think that there's one approach that is better or worse when we're dealing with people and interpersonal interactions that relate to broader social issues? I think I got the question. So, I, what usually bothers me is that people think my mother is a monster, that she was trying to sell me into marriage, and, um, or they think that my family didn't like me. Uh, I think for us, for you guys, since uh, we don't interact with this um, always, it's always better to speak about where the problem is coming or where it's rooted. I mean, uh, some countries, uh, poverty is the main reason, illiteracy is the main reason. And so, like today, Afghanistan, families are starting to sell their daughters again because of poverty. And because they think this is the way to protect them from being raped. So if you want to talk about an issue that is kind of foreign to you, I think it's always better to talk about the reason behind it, why it's happening, not why these people, like, uh, don't point at those people, because this is what they learned. Like my mom, she learned from her mom. She could not possibly see uh, any different ways for me than being a wife. Uh, because this happened to my sisters, this happened to our neighbors, and that was the way for her to go. In order to be a good Afghan woman, she had to follow the traditions, and the traditions meant to sell your daughters. Thank you. Do you, you sometimes feel powerless, and if you do, how do you deal with it? And how do you have hope? How do you have hope? Uh, obviously, that's something that I said, I do still have fears within me. Like, what happened in Afghanistan, I felt like I couldn't do anything. I was here on board, safe, okay, but I felt so bad that um, there was nothing I could do besides posting, besides calling friends and checking on them. And in, in this kind of moment, uh, first of all, I can't really think of anything that I could do right away. But then um, I have to take a break and think about different possibilities. And what I did for Afghanistan was that I took a break and then I went to a few protests in the city and then I organized a few protests. Um, it, it wasn't on campus somewhere else and then we did work with CCE. Uh, so these are the different things that I did to make myself feel better. And um, again, I did feel very powerless even today. And that's why I made a few other songs. Uh, because again, through song, if I could change my family, I'm sure there are more families that could be changed. So I'm still continuing doing this through music and through uh, doing Arazu, which is helping, if not so many kids, at least a few children are being saved through this program. And this also makes me feel better about myself. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, so the, the, the wireless mic, the battery ran out. Did you guys speak up? Yes. Oh, yeah. That's great. <laughs> um, this, this might be a difficult question to answer. But uh, this is also more broad. But so the, there are these vicious cycles that exist. I mean, for us, they seem pretty vicious. And actually, for you, it felt vicious when you were in the middle of it. Um, do you think that there is a way out of that, these vicious cycles where you're not just put into a 
another one, or is there light at the end of light's tunnel in your perspective? Or do you think that all the women in Afghanistan who are being kept against their will will find a way out? Um, I was talking to an activist the other day. We were talking about uh, human rights, women's rights, and she came to the conclusion that there will, there's not going to be, there won't be a time that all the people are going to be served equal, and there is always going to be one part of the world that some people. Uh, complaining about their rights, some people's rights are going to be violated. Because as, for example, if I'm uh, growing a business and taking over other people's jobs and ordering other people around, I don't know how to make this work in this, but um, I'm saying that if uh, I help Afghan women in Afghanistan to have access to their rights, um, I'm sure there is going to be another country suffering from the same thing. So I don't want you to think about this uh, knowing that this is not going to be um, solved in the future or ever. But the fact that if you could give some people that have never had an, a chance to experience what freedom is, um, what it means to have access to their rights. It could really make a positive uh, change in the future, and maybe in hundred years in the future, maybe there's going to be less uh, humanitarian crisis because of what we are facing today. And I'm not sure. Anyone want to answer this question? Come on, guys, this is a good opportunity for you to speak up. Yeah, come on, guys. What? I said yes, come on, guys. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you a good question. Not that should happen, but I'll ask a question. Yeah, I just wanted to say that in Iran, because I wanted to really um, face my fear, which one of them was speaking in the crowd. I, I usually went to different events, I didn't even need to be there. And I ask questions just to like practice my fear, like practice how to face my fear. So if this is how you're feeling, don't be scared. Just ask questions or respond to someone else's question. So you can go first. No, just okay. Yeah. Question, but I guess like when you, your audience is probably a lot of a younger generation, but there, I feel like there must be some line between the younger generation and the older generation who hear you and your song, like your music, and your message. And I guess how do you? I mean, there must be some point of frustration with the older generation, perhaps not really understanding the message completely just based on how skilled it is in their lives? Like, is there a point of frustration you have to overcome in order to, like, kind of see through it and, like, kind of march on? Or have you been able to deal with that? Or do you feel that at all? I haven't felt that way. And I like both audiences because, obviously, new generation, young generation is uh, great for raising awareness through social media, um, doing art pieces, whatever it is, your own way. And older audience, usually they pay more attention to what I'm doing, and they actually come to me and ask so many questions, like how they can uh, help, or where they can uh, find more information. Uh, so for them, it's this process or the, the project that I'm doing, it's something that could grow bigger and they want to be a part of it. So I guess I need both of them because um, if you want to do something brother, you also need to promote the event projects and that is my young generation. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll ask a question and it will seem like I'm yelling at you because I'll, I'll try to speak <laughs> that, that worked, yes. Okay, so um, first of all, thanks so much for being here and doing this. Uh, I was interested in your focus on dreams and this incredible book that you shared, which uh, is so intimate and that you shared it with us is, uh, is extraordinary. But what I'm thinking about is uh, dreams are interesting because we don't know where they come from. And the way that you narrated the story, it was realizing that you had dreams that sort of got you out of the bubble that you were in. And a lot of the things that you've been talking about and we've been talking about in the classes uh, is about the courage required once you know what you want to do, once you have an idea, the courage that's necessary to do it. But I'm wondering if you can say something about how you get the idea in the first place. And what I'm thinking of specifically is you said um, your mother didn't have, uh, wouldn't have thought of doing anything different. Your sisters wouldn't have thought of any, doing anything different. And there's a, a very interesting question about how one ever gets to the point of thinking about doing something different. And I'm wondering if you can say for you specifically how it happened, how it was that you got to think differently from your sisters and your mother, and whether in your experience there's anything more generally you can say about how that happens, what conditions are necessary, or what makes it happen. There may be nothing general to say, but if you have insight into that, I'd be interested to hear. So, I guess I was so lucky that I kind of grew up in Iran, because the NGO that I mentioned, they have classes for Afghan students. And one of those classes was um, life skills, skills life. Um, and in this class, that I did not know anything about it, we had uh, magazines, images, and newspapers. Uh, the teacher would ask us to come forward and talk about the dreams that we have. Well, for the first class, I remember that I could not remember what dreams I had or what dreams meant. And uh, because I grew up in Afghanistan, uh, I was there for a while. Uh, we did not really have any role model around us. And it took a while for Afghan students to really uh, know what their dreams were, because at the beginning they did not know before going to that class. So this class was a great introduction uh, for all of us, because we got to know ourselves first of all. Like We, uh, we had too many dreams, because sometimes they would bring newspapers, magazines, and, and then uh, we would need more of them, because we had too many, and we needed more pages, and we needed more images. Uh, so that class really helped me to see a broader uh, future for myself. When my mom came to Iran to take me back to Afghanistan, uh, at the beginning I was actually like giving up. Uh, I was like, so what am I going to do? This is something that happened to my sister, so it is my son now. But looking at my dreams book honestly turned me to a rebel girl, I guess. Uh, and uh, that's the reason why I asked the uh, filmmaker, Rosara Maimabami, if she could buy me and give the money to my mom so she could go back to Afghanistan. And then in that period, the time that I had, I could work on my music and finish the studying. So when she left, I started working on music. And this is how uh, I got to come to the U.S. because I got the time and I knew where I wanted to be. Not in the U.S., but somewhere different from Afghanistan, Iran, and something different from being a wife. Thank you. Um, uh, so I'm really curious, uh, since coming to Bard, how have your studies here, or kind of just, like, your experiences since coming here, how has that shaped your, um, 
music, your direction as an artist, and also kind of your politics. Um, and I'm of course aware that like this is a hard talk, we're at hard, but like I would be curious if there's also anything to be critical about. Like like pros and cons, you know. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, I went to American University in 2018, and then I came to BART, and BART was my last option. Um, because I had no other choices, I said, okay, then I'm going to go to BART. So, how, after being here for a while, I, I couldn't be more happy than now, because the classes that I'm taking is close to what I care about, like music and human rights. And, uh, in terms of music, I have to say that now I can read notes, which is very important to me because I used to play guitar in Iran and I could not read notes easily like now. So I see progress in um, the music and learning a lot about human rights and uh, I, you know how many books you are all assigned to read so that it was the same for me we had to read all of those um, willingly or unwillingly so learned a lot through those and um, for me it's most of it positive being at birth I'm not uh, advertising for anyone or anything <laughs> But I'm being honest that I really like Bart because of its community, because it's really small. And unlike American University here, I can always access my teachers. They're always there to support you and give you more support uh, if you need it, especially for international students, but we're still learning English. Yeah, or, uh, son? Yeah. yeah. Um, you said when you were, you were answering Thomas's question about the dreams that you should go through your dreams, you should knew who you were, and that and and that gave you the courage to, to act. I mean, one of the things that when we taught these courage courses in the past that we've explored is that the line between courage and stupidity. Foolhardiness. You know, the person in charge is alone in the battle. Are they courage? Are they courageous? Or, or are they stupid? Um, and you know, I think we all hear whether it's in Afghanistan now, whether or in Russia, wherever protesters are being arrested on a daily basis. A guy was holding up an empty sign yesterday and was arrested for holding up an empty sign. Um, you know, to what degree do you tell if you know, and so one of the things that uh, you know we've talked about in these courses in the past is is can you convince somebody to be courageous? Is it a, a cost-benefit calculation? And when you talked about your dreams, you said you just, I knew who I was. And I'm wondering, did you sit down and make a cost-benefit calculation? If I do this, this will happen. If I don't do this, this will happen. Or was it just something that you realized you had to do? Is it is it sort of a is it, a, is it a sense of there is no other choice? I'll either do what I'm, I'll either sing the song and do what I'm doing, or I'm going to not be myself. Or is it a kind of calculation that you can teach people about? And and that really goes to what the course is about, because the course raises the question of whether courage is something that can be taught and how. And I'm wondering what you what your thoughts on on that are. So, obviously, for me, courage is not something that you can touch someone right away or buy it from some, somewhere. And the reason that I had to be courageous was the fact that if I wouldn't take a step, if I would not uh, take action, I knew that I would be in this place that was designed for me by others, which means you have to stay in a zone where you're not allowed to go outside, you're not allowed to experience other things, 
So I guess the hunger for me to experience outside the world is the reason that I decided to risk. And um, over the time, I, I had so many issues with like feeling comfortable with being courageous because what I was doing at that time, I was telling myself that this is dumb, this is stupid, you're going against all these people. But then I was like, if you want to be different, you have to go a different direction. So that's what I wanted to do, because I wanted to be different from what I was seeing around me. I wanted to experience something different. Uh, so of, of course, it's, it feels sometimes that it's stupid. And you, if you want to be courageous, sometimes you will feel this way, uh, like standing in a crowd of people speaking or singing. Uh, some people might think this is stupid, but for you it's courage. So it has all these uh, thoughts that it can be courageous, it can be stupid. Uh, it's up to you, but uh, for me, as I said, it's all about knowing what is more for me, what future could be out there for me than what I already knew. Because I wanted to experience something new than seeing what my sisters were experiencing. I guess that's it. Thank you so much, guys.